Down, so that's a good time to get it. Good morning. The time is now 9.37 a.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of April 12, 2016 is called to order. First item is approval of the agenda and order of priority. Are there any additional items to add or to delete from the agenda? I move approval. It's been, it's been moved in support to approve the agenda. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. There is an information folder item. Information on the Michigan Mathematics and Science Center Network is in that folder for you to review. No action will be taken on that. First, uh, next item is introduction of guests and state board members. At this time, Marilyn will introduce the members of the State Board of Education and will ask the audience members to introduce yourselves. Marilyn, please. Thank you. To my immediate left is the State Superintendent and also Chairman of the Board, Brian Whiston. As we go around the table, John Austin is the President of the Board. He resides in Ann Arbor. The bo Board's Vice President is Cassandra Albrich from Rochester Hills. Michelle Fecto is right here in the red sweater. She's from Detroit. She's the board secretary. Board member Richard Ziley is from Dearborn. Michigan Teacher of the Year for this year is Rick Joseph. He teaches at Birmingham Covington School. Across the table, um, Eileen Weiser is on her way. Um, also, there's a chair for the governor's representative um, who will not be joining us today. Um, there's a vacancy in that position right now. In the red jacket, Kathleen Strauss, she's board member from Detroit. And Lupe Ramos Montini is board member from Grand Rapids. She's the board's National Association of State Boards of Education delegate. And next to me is Pamela Pugh. She's the board's treasurer. She resides in Saginaw. I'm Marilyn Schneider. I'm the state board executive. And if you'd like to introduce yourself, Andy, do you want to start back there? Sure. Andy Middleson, I'm the director of the Standards and Assessment Office here at MBE. I'm Bob Wright, I'm just a citizen. I'm here to do <coughs> things. How you guys do things? <coughs> Gary Jensen, ACT Michigan. Amy Colton, Executive Director of Learning Forward Michigan. Kimberly Hampton, Board Member of Learning Forward Michigan. Gary Owens, ETS, Bengal. Uh, Randy Fleener, Superintendent Lakewood Public Schools, just here to observe. Judy. Judy Pritchett, Macomb Intermediate School District. Terrence Sanders, <coughs> Superintendent of the Calhoun Intermediate School, the school District. Paul Salah, Wayne Risa. Kathy Dewsbury White, Michigan Assessment Consortium. Tom Green, MEA. David Michelson, MEA. Marla Moss, Office of School Support Services, Department of Ed. Marty Ackley, the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs here at the Department of Education. Alice Ann Henry, the Superintendent's Office here at MBE. Norma Jean Sass, Deputy Superintendent, Educational Services. Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent, Accountability Services. Morning, Algron, Deputy Superintendent for Administrative Services. <coughs> Morning, Wendy Larvick from the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs. Good morning, Ben Williams from the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs. Barbara Brish from SEAC. Kevin Toby, a teacher at Hazel High School. Adam Brumplazak, Director of the Office of Educator Talent and Policy Coordination. Welcome to all, and uh, if you do uh, wish to speak today, if you could fill out a card and turn it into Maryland, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. So I want to publicly express our thanks to Karen McPhee, who is not here. Uh, she had served for a year as the governor's education advisor. She was a valuable resource for all of us. Karen has retired from her position, and the governor's office is in the process of looking for a replacement <laughs> and will be joining us at future meetings. So. Karen, we thank you for your service. And to Kathleen Strauss, who, who was honored during the Cesar Chavez Social Justice Activities in Grand Rapids on March 17th. Lupe 
Ramos Mondini is uh, the driving force in this annual event. Richard Ziley attended and Ben uh, Williams attended on my behalf. So congratulations to Kathleen Strauss. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Lupe only does amazing work. <laughs> All right, the first item on today's Committee of the Whole agenda is a presentation on the assessment literacy standards for Michigan. The Michigan Department of Education continues to produce and administer first class assessments in Michigan. One of the next steps is to improve assessment literacy around the state. The assessment literacy standards created by the Michigan Assessment Consortium can provide a benchmark to begin to improve the knowledge of assessments and the data and reports they produce across the state. So next steps will be an endorsement of the assessment literacy standards of Michigan at the May board meeting. Presenters today are Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent of Accountability Services, and Andy Minnelstadt, Director of Standards and Assessments. Thank you, Superintendent, and good morning, board members. Uh, we're excited to be here to talk about assessment literacy standards today. We're going to take just a minute to talk about uh, the exciting, what the exciting work that's going on right now today, as you guys probably know, MSTEP started yesterday. The second uh, administration of the MSTEP started yesterday, and today, uh, Michigan high school juniors are taking the SAT. So, as you probably know, research shows that offering a college entrance exam helps helps increase a free college entrance exam helps increase college going, particularly in low income students. Michigan's been able to offer this for almost 10 years now, and we're excited to continue doing that this year. So first year of the SAT, kids are probably testing right now. Um, wanted to also say, like I said, we started our second administration yesterday. Some good news, it's all good news yesterday, it went very smoothly. We have almost 28,000 test sessions completed. Uh, we're 96% online this year, up from 82% last year. So again, thanks to our trade partners who build, help us build and administer the technology infrastructure we need. Uh, our activity on day one was up 35%, but calls to the Help Center were down 75%. So everybody's in, they're testing, it's going smoothly. Um, and just wanted to reiterate, you know, under Superintendent Wiston's leadership, we've made some major improvements to this year's MSTEP. Uh, instructional time, the amount of instructional time that was taken was a concern, so we cut 2.5 hours in grades 3, 4, 6, and 7, and a full 8 hours in grade 11. And now we're down below a half percent of instructional time, well below the federal guidelines of 2% instructional time and one of the lowest testing time states in the nation. So I think we think we are working in support of finding that balance between high quality assessment but not leaving too large of a footprint in schools. Second thing, we're turning data quickly this year. We will be, our goal, we are, uh, and you guys will see tomorrow, we'll, we'll start seeing this come in, our goal is to turn um, preliminary reporting within 48 hours of when a student completes the test session. So that, that's a very quick turnaround. Uh, we know that teachers need that information in their hands and then um, all reports, final reporting will be out before the start of school. And the final thing relates directly to this. We've made a big investment this year in helping people understand what the assessment is, how to use the data. Um, because regardless of what assessment is given if people don't know how to use the data that comes out of it to improve instruction, to talk to their students about learning, to talk to parents, then it's, it's not doing what it needs to do. And so we need to increase our efforts around training and support. We did want to show you, um, we have a very short video, sorry to take your time, but we're excited about what's happening with MSTEP this year. Um, we wanted to show you, this is a student experience video. So what is it like to take the MSTEP um, as a student? We all want children to succeed in school and the workplace. To ensure students are ready to succeed, Michigan has high academic standards developed for educators by educators that guide what is taught in the classroom. As learning standards are updated to meet current and future workplace demands, how they are measured also changes. This spring, students will take the Michigan Student Test of Educational Progress, or MSTEP, for the second year. MSTEP is a 21st century test. It has fewer multiple choice questions and more questions requiring problem solving and critical thinking skills. This year, the Michigan Department of Education has made several improvements to MSTEP. For example, the test is now shorter for most, meaning students will spend less time taking tests and more time learning. For high school students, the new SAT will serve as both a college entrance exam and the State English Language Arts and Mathematics Assessment, reducing test time by up to eight hours. 
We are also committed to providing parents, teachers, and schools with faster results. Schools will receive preliminary results within a few days after testing is complete. All testing concludes by June, and final results should be available prior to the beginning of the next school year. As with nearly everything students do now in school, the M-STEP involves technology and is administered to most students on a computer. As part of the continuing effort to provide students with the best possible testing experience, this year Michigan is adding computer adaptive testing to the M-STEP English Language Arts and Mathematics Assessment given in grades 3 through 8. Computer adaptive testing uses today's technology to provide a more personalized test experience for students. It also provides a more precise measurement of student learning. Instead of giving all students the same questions in the same order, computer adaptive testing customizes questions based on student responses, drawing from questions designed for each subject and grade. The more questions a student gets right, the more challenging the next questions become. If answers are incorrect, the questions adjust to meet students' knowledge and skill level. The level of questions never go above or below a student's grade level. Balancing questions in this way ensures students are engaged and challenged, but not overwhelmed. They don't have to struggle with questions that are too difficult or spend time on questions that are too easy. Scoring is based on both the number of correct answers provided and the difficulty of the items completed providing more precise information on student learning and growth. Test security is also improved since students don't all get the same questions. To help your student prepare for M-STEP, an online test with sample test items is available by grade and subject. While some students may practice these items at school, they can also practice at home. If you are interested in ways to help your student prepare for the M-STEP, visit www.michigan.gov slash mstep. This site contains the Spring 2016 Guide to State Assessments, which contains information about how long the tests will take and the subjects that students will be tested on in each grade. It explains where to find sample test items by grade level and subject matter, and contains testing schedule information, such as testing dates, average length of test, and more. Check with your local school for more detailed information on when M-STEP testing will take place. M-STEP results provide parents, schools, businesses, and communities with an important snapshot of how students are doing at a school, district, and state level. State assessment data are also used by educators to help inform instruction and support students. And if you're worried about the amount of time spent on testing, don't be. State assessments require less than 1% of student instruction time each year. For more information, visit www.michigan.gov slash mstep. So thank you for allowing us to show you that. That's our parent video, I should have said. We also have one coming that's about the student experience. Um, and want to take one more minute and just say a really sincere thank you to the team downstairs. They are working round the clock to make sure that Michigan students get a world-class assessment designed by Michigan educators for Michigan kids. They care deeply about this being a good experience for Michigan students, teachers, principals, and all of us. So thank you to the team. Um, couldn't do it without them. And with that, we'll talk about assessment literacy standards. All right. Uh, so assessment literacy standards uh, is something that we want to spend some time thinking about because as you see in our MSEP video and the things we've talked about over the past couple of years about assessment is assessments here it's not going away and really the next step that we want to look at is how do we take these assessments that we give our students uh, whether it's state assessments or local assessments or district assessments and take that information that we get and bring it to the next level how do we use that information better um, how do we engage and change instruction in the classroom and how do we just apply it to everyday life uh, in the education community uh, so we want to bring these assessment literacy standards to you um, to begin the process of looking at those things. Um, our assessments, like the M-STEP and other assessments these days, are really looking at measuring uh, 21st, 21st century skills in a lot of different ways. Uh, we're looking at um, constructing and responding uh, to problems, creative and problem-solving skills, demonstrating <coughs> performance-type activities, analyzing and applying. It's not just what we used to know as the fact recall uh, type assessments that we've been using in the past. These are things that we really want to look at with today's assessments uh, to really hit kids uh, where they're at today and help them move towards careers and college uh, readiness in lots of different ways. 
Um, what we know as assessments is really evolving. You know, I look at this table right here. Um, the assessment paradigm is changing. Uh, if you look on the left, you know, I would say that the left column is 10, 15 years ago. How do we look at assessments then? Maybe longer. Over on the right is where we are at today in a lot of different ways. We're working to change uh, the paradigm of what assessment is and, and why we do it. If you look on the left, you know, let's say it's, um, you know, back 10, 15 years ago. We had summative tests. We just used it for state accountability. Uh, we only did it after we did learning uh, in the school year. Um, we, we smashed everything together and kids just got a score. Uh, it's really just a, 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 an accountability measure in a lot of different ways. And over on the right, where we're trying to get to with the M-STEP and the other things we're discussing, is we really want it to be a summative, informative activity, not just the end of year test. We want teaching and learning tools to come from our assessments. Uh, it needs to be an activity that's being done during and after learning. Uh, we want to get detailed descriptions of results and things like that. And to be able to do that, uh, we need to work on increasing the awareness of assessment and, and, and educators and the public knowledge of what that data means and how they can use it in different ways. First thing you want to do when we look at that, and this is a familiar graphic that we've seen before, we want to look for a balanced assessment system. Uh, so we'll start over here on the left. We know we have state standards uh, that specify K-12 expectations for college and career readiness in Michigan. Uh, we know we have those standards. The end goal that we all have is we want students to leave high school uh, that are college and career ready. We want them to be prepared for whatever and wherever they want to go after they're done with high school. Uh, we want to make sure we equip them and prepare them uh, to do that. Um, <coughs> in the middle, we have teachers in schools. They have information and tools. We want to make sure they can use them to improve teaching and learning. And here's where assessments can come in. You know, we're all familiar with the top of the triangle where we have summative assessments out there, uh, like the M-STEP and like the MEEP used to be. Uh, we give those to look at how students are doing on mastering their grade level content uh, for whatever content level or content area and grade they're in. Uh, and then down on the bottom of the triangle, we really are working towards looking at a, a vision about how do we use interim assessments or formative assessment practices? How do we look at assessment more than just once a year? Because uh, we want the system to be flexible, open, and used for actionable feedback, not just after the whole school year is done, but throughout the school year any way that we can. Um, so this is still continues to be our goal here uh, in Michigan. We looked at this really for the last five years, this, this triangle, and we continue to use that as our backbone of where we want to go moving forward. So what does assessment literacy look like? How does it impact the improvement process in our classrooms? You know, if you look at this graphic, you know, so the top green bubble there and gathering information, that we do. We know we give tests and we get the information back. We know that's happening with M-STEP, we know that's happening with local assessments, district assessments. Uh, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff is happening uh, right now as we, you know, do our everyday lives. Then as you go around clockwise around the graphic, you know, the pinkish bubble, um, is about analyzing data, setting goals, set measurable objectives, and research best practices. There are areas of state that are doing that in a lot of different ways. You know, they're figuring out how to work with their data. They're plugging it into their different systems. They're trying to use it to um, look at how their schools are structured, how instruction is happening, and things like that. But it's not happening statewide yet, and we want that to happen. We want to get to that place. And as you continue to go around, we want people to take that analysis of the data and you know, looking at that to plan. How are we going to plan to develop improvement plans? How are we going to use our assessments um, like the M-STEP to um, look at next school year? How do we, do we need to change programming? Do we need to relook at how we deliver the content standards in Michigan? You know, how do we need to change things so that uh, students can continue to learn better and have more opportunities to learn? And that goes around to the bubble on the left there. And do it. Let's, let's look at the data. Let's develop some plans and let's, let's do it. Let's carry out um, any changes that we might want to. Let's see how it's going. Let's continue to evaluate what's happening. You know, we want um, this feedback loop that we have here about school improvement. We want uh, assessments and tools uh, to be happening year round. And we want this to be a continual process uh, as we work through uh, building out our assessment system in Michigan. So what does assessment literacy mean? How do we define it? You know, one possible definition that we like to use here is an, an assessment literate individual is somebody that understands how student assessment can enable them to better carry out their role in education, believes that assessment can improve teaching and learning, and puts into place activities and behaviors to act on these beliefs. You know, the short version of that is we want people to understand why we're testing, we want them to understand what the data is that they get back, and how to use it to improve, you know, their role and their job and improve student uh, opportunities as we move forward. 
like Andy said, we know that increasing our assessment literacy as a state is an important improvement that we make, again, for all levels of the assessment system and regardless of which assessment is used. Um, if, if people lack an understanding about assessment um, and aren't able to use the data or make uh, good decisions from the data, then it's not a valuable enterprise to, to our educational system. So we need literacy at all levels. Uh, policymaker level and, and leadership level in our schools, uh, certainly at the teacher level. Um, these standards help us deal or address the what should teachers be learning in pre-service, what should principals and other school leaders be learning in pre-service training programs. Um, there's <coughs> a lot of misunderstanding by parents and students about what student assessment is for. And then there's a lot of change around assessments, right? So people being able to, able to understand what's going on, uh, what's coming, what these data can do. Uh, we need, we have a need for increased assessment literacy there. Um, research has also shown that students who are more involved in their own learning and their assessment achieve more and that formative assessment is also the most powerful form of assessment, that assessment that's close to the student learning. Uh, but it requires that teachers really understand how to use these ongoing instructionally embedded assessment, how to do that, how to use the data. Again, so it's not just something that happens. Assessment shouldn't just be something that happens because we have to. It should be woven into the instructional fabric of a school. Um, take a minute. I think we talked. Kathy introduced herself. But these standards were designed by the Michigan Assessment Consortium. They're a nonprofit organization um, of Michigan educators. And their goal is to promote greater understanding uh, about and use of assessment in Michigan. So they have a number of resources, but uh, they worked for a number of years to pull these standards together. So who needs to be assessment literate? Uh, really, everyone with a stake in education. Students, parents and guardians, um, teachers, specialists, building administrators, policymakers, and the public. Um, we all need to know what to do with these results. So these standards, and you have them in front of you, they were created to address um, all of these groups help us understand what skills, what knowledge is necessary at all levels. Uh, they also uh, they also allow us to kind of target the important messages to the different groups. Uh, there are separate standards for students, parents, teachers, administrators, and policymakers. And then the literacy standards break into three components: kind of dispositions, then specific knowledge, and performance. So why do we want these? Why now? Why do we want these to come in? They give us a common basis for our work in increasing assessment literacy. Once we agree what assessment literacy is, we can do a number of things. We can build out training for teachers and principals. We can work with pre-service programs. We can build things like the video or other things that can be used to be helpful for the different um, groups that we talked about, parents, teachers, students, administrators. And we can agree with what assessment literacy looks like. Um, these standards went through, you see here, I won't read this to you, but they went through a, a pretty extensive process with the MAC to be reviewed. They've been reviewed internally. And again, I, I look at it as giving us a common language to talk about what do we mean by make sure a teacher knows how to use assessments? What do we mean by make sure principals understand how to do this? We want to use them in just that way. Uh, use them cross office to develop a strategy so that educators are prepared to use data and assessments across the state. Um, develop professional development, and really take our state to the next level of becoming a 10 in 10 state. If data is a driver for instruction, then we all need to be prepared to use it. Uh, we need to be very intentional about that preparation. So. You know, one thing that is really neat about uh, these standards, and the document we handed out, this is just a, a shiny version of what we emailed out in a PDF file before, but what is really cool about uh, these literacy standards that we're looking at, we talked about all these groups that we want to make sure we can target. You know, it's easy for us to think about, we just need to improve assessment literacy and look at it from just one lens for all groups. Well, that's not really how we need to look at it. And so the document in here with the literacy standards pulls out specific things for the different types of folks. You know, parents might need to look at it from a different lens than a policymaker. You know, a district administrator might want to look at it differently from a teacher. So as you look through the document, there's really um, a lot of opportunity and power in having specific things for each of those groups of folks. Uh, I think it's really going to help guide us as we begin to prepare professional development activities and learning modules to help you know, increase this literacy around Michigan. So thank you for your consideration of the standards and uh, Superintendent, back to you.
Any questions? Yes, Pam. Um, Vanessa, in general, I guess, going back to the beginning of the conversation <laughs> around assessments in general, we were at the ESSA training and um, the NASB mm -hmm. conference. And so one of the things that was talked about is I think it's is it special funding um, that can be attained for <laughs> communities or states to do audits of assessments um, to talk about what are the assessments that are going on in specific communities mm -hmm. and how can we reduce redundancy. Are we going to look at that? Um, so I think um, we want to look at all the opportunities ESSA gives us. So we're still sorting through all of those. We did in the last year, we did a survey of districts to look at who's, uh, we asked, we built a district assessment inventory and they have been working with it. And we also collected data on that. So we have some, but I think this audit opportunity would be very good for Michigan. Do we have to well. apply for that? I don't think it's given to all states. Not sure. Or, we don't, okay. We're still sorting. I mean, we don't know for sure. Certainly, if we have to apply, we will. Okay. You know, but it may be something that everybody can do. We or maybe it's each do. district. I think local districts can. We'll get more information. Can. Okay. About it. So, okay. and then the other question that I have, or just thoughts that I have um, in the assessment literacy standards, um, communities uh, are doing community health needs assessments, um, mm -hmm. and so it's where all community <laughs> partners come together, whether it's health, uh, uh, the. And then we also have the uh, social services bodies that come together, and that's where we really pool data together and also um, decide what are the priorities in the community and then base our action planning, our collective planning around um, making sure that we're having positive outcomes. So I think that something like this would be quite beneficial to those bodies as well. Okay. And so I don't know how we would, I mean, I, obviously we could go through the school districts, but if there's any way that we could get mm -hmm. directly to those bodies, I think it would be helpful not only in ma making sure that our children are having better outcomes and being able to have the the measures there to measure that, but I think that these are also ways that we can measure whether mm -hmm. the districts and the boards are, are on point as well. It's a great suggestion. And I know one of the things that uh, Superintendent Weston has been working on with the department is community partnerships and partnerships right. with agencies and strengthening those ties. So I think using, Some objective using this objective. as one of those tools that we share out is a great idea. So thank you. Rick, then Cassandra. I just want to applaud you both, gotcha, uh, Andrew and Vanessa, for your work on this, and also say from a classroom teacher's perspective that the opportunity to use assessment as a legitimate teaching tool and not as a gotcha is so critical. And so helping us all get past the notion that test or exam or quizzes is something that should instill fear in someone's heart, which I think traditionally we've all experienced, and transforming that notion into this is an opportunity to differentiate instruction. This is an opportunity to see where are you? How can we move you from wherever you are to wherever you can be? And then, as you said, Vanessa, that, that formative assessment is the best, most meaningful kind of assessment. And if we can really help instill that, um, then we're, we're, we're really making big change. And I see that evident here um, in these standards. So thank you for this. Thank you. Cassandra and then Eileen. Um, so I, I echo the gratitude that was expressed. Um, I was reading through this, I kept trying to come back to what's the ultimate purpose, and I couldn't figure out why this was bothering me so much. And then I think what, it, what I decided it was is that there are some real legitimate concerns that are expressed about assessments and testing and the direction that we've headed, and the document doesn't seem to acknowledge that. And maybe that's on purpose. Um, but I, I kept coming back to um, that feeling that, you know, there are people who are very questionable about assessment, mm -hmm. and for some good reason. Mm -hmm. um, and so while I think it's, it's proper to want to educate all these different groups about that, I think we still need to keep in mind that there are legitimate concerns and, mm -hmm. and critiques, and it's okay to acknowledge that. Um, the one thing that I had specific in here that um, kept popping out to me was for the students, uh, in two different places, it talks about how assessments can improve their attitude, and that seems like a bit of a stretch to me. Um, if anything, if I remember my days in high school, assessments met bad, you know, <laughs> our attitude was negative towards assessments. So um, I, I just think that that might be taking it a little too far, but th that's my only um, critique. I, um, thank you for those comments. and I, I 
want to underscore that these assessment literacy standards, they are assessment agnostic. And to Rick's point, I think assessment, we tend to hear the word assessment and we think state summative assessment. But going back to the triangle Andy showed, we're really, assessment's the whole enterprise. And a, the biggest part of the triangle often is the formative, the work that teachers do to say, what have you learned and what do you know? And that's part of the instructional cycle. So these are assessment ag agnostic, whatever we do in the big picture with the tool, there's still data out there and information on student learning and we want to make sure people know how to use that effectively. Um, and I also think that's the student attitude piece. Like if students, when students, if we can move towards students seeing it as feedback on their performance in a short cycle way, not a gotcha way to use Rick's words, I think that could help. But we have some, we have a distance to go, so, I think is So maybe the answer to that is not only to include in here what we should do with data, but what we shouldn't do with data. How data should not be used. That's a good point. Thank you, Cassandra, Eileen, then Kathleen. Uh, well, Cassandra just gave me my entree into uh, telling uh, everybody I can that the National Assessment Governing Board is going to be releasing the uh, technology, engineering, and literacy assessment standards for eighth graders, uh, not standards, but the assessment, which has just been given for the first time on May 17th at Michigan Science Center. And the reason that I bring that up is that, believe it or not, when they were giving the pilots for this, the kids, they couldn't drag the kids off the computers because it's a problem-solving computer adaptive assessment that uh, the kids really loved it. Um, the more they got into it, the more they realized what the variables were, and it was a, a wonderful, affirmative, <laughs> unbelievably an affirmative assessment. So mm -hmm. my comments, though, are addressed to you and the Michigan Assessment Con Consortium. Congratulations on doing this. Uh, I think that one of the hardest parts, I served for eight years on the National Assessment Governing Board, and as Cassandra said, all that anybody remembers about assessment is pain. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you uh, move assessment through to the other side so that it's not, it is constructive mm -hmm. and it is viewed by teachers and by parents as something that shows whether or not tax dollars are working, shows that children are being prepared for life, and shows that teachers are being given what they need to be successful, because that is so much of what's going on. Um, the, I have two, um, after that preamble, I have two things that I wanted to ask about. One is, this, the pages 14 and 15 of this document um, are really instructive. There are things on there that I would like to be refreshed on. And for newer board members who came into uh, uh, assessment uh, during the um, uh, SBAC discussions, uh, you know, that's basically the starting point for what you know. So you may know more than some of the rest of us do for older members, just getting a reorientation on how assessment is doing. When I went on the MAC website, uh, I was really intrigued by the articles that were there about where assessment could be, uh, what, what we need to do with teacher training to make that happen. So is there a plan for making sure that the blue window on page 15, that all those policymaker audiences get training in this? Um, and uh, if there's not a plan, developing one would be really appropriate mm -hmm. because why put this together unless right. it's taken a full, full stretch? Yep. And then the second question is, there's been a lot of discussion about NWEA recently. And given that we are just in the middle of administering NSTEP, my 15-year-old my is <coughs> taking the PSAT tomorrow, uh, how, does, how, how do NWEA's current products fit into the overall assessment portfolio that, that schools are delivering on, on behalf of the state, the feds, and uh, local, local teachers and districts. They have a proposed product. How does that fit in? And uh, does, does NWA allow the same kinds of accommodations that MSTEP does for uh, special <coughs> education students, and is there a paper form that can be given? So I'll answer your first question and then um, talk a little bit about the second one, although that's, it's hard to answer a lot of those questions at this point in time. The, is there a plan? The bringing the standards here to you is the first step. So if we agree that these are the standards, then we can develop a, a training plan for all these audiences. And that's exactly what we want to do. That's why we push to get these endorsed so that we could agree this is who we want to train and this is how and start building those products. Um, in terms of your second question, there are a number of products on the market that districts use in a benchmark format. And I know the superintendent was very successful in Dearborn using NWEA, iReady is out there, People, uh, a lot of ISDs have built their own benchmarks. Um, there's a, going to be a large conversation about how all of this can work together to provide more growth data um, for students. And you know, a lot of the questions you ask are things that are just hard to answer at this point in time. But I think you outlined some of the questions that we need to engage with as a state. <coughs> Thanks. Yeah. 
Thanks. Kathleen and then Michelle. Yeah, well, uh, some of the things I wanted to say have already been said, so uh, let me just get to, uh, I, I think it's important to do this because there is such a, so much antipathy to tests now, it's such a campaign to get rid of tests, really nationwide, and including Michigan. There are lots of people who are unhappy about them. So the more we can explain why, in simple terms and short, if we can have a, like a brief introduction <coughs> that gives us why we need them in, in 25 words or less or mm -hmm. something like that. But, uh, and follow up on what Eileen was saying about the policy, the policymaker audience, I think that's really critical. And we should prepare, I, I think you should prepare a short presentation to give to the legislature. And not only you, you list the uh, House and Senate Education Committees, but I think you also should list the appropriation subcommittees. <laughs> they're, they're critical uh, on state aid and the department budget. So. Uh, both of those would be, I think, very important to add to that list and to make presentations to them, especially every year that we get so many new mm -hmm. legislators, new state House members at any rate, and they may or may not know anything about it. <coughs> I think that's a critical audience that we should be prepared to do that, not when, we're, not when you're talking about removing the funding for whatever test we want to give. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when they first start, to mm -hmm. give them a good introduction to them. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. Michelle, please. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. And I really do appreciate the efforts to reduce the time mm -hmm. and um, to make sure the results come back more quickly. Um, and my daughter is taking the SAT right now and uh, was very nervous about it. Um, so my, I think the... Um, a lot of the pushback on the assessments is not necessarily about getting to know what the kids know and helping instruct them, it's the, what it's linked to. Mm -hmm. And so um, the, teacher, the teacher evaluations, the rankings of schools based on these tests. So it sounds like there's some th more discussion about and literacy around what this mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if in that discussion, there'll be discussion of um, the limits of the standardized tests, the lack, the lack of validity in using them for teacher assessments and in school assessments. And uh, will they be looking, at, will there be an opportunity to look at <coughs> some of the um, underlying things that make <coughs> these tests and, uh, and un you know, invalid, such as the, the, the turnover and things like that. So um, while I agree the focus should be on the, the child mm -hmm. and um, and especially if it can give a teacher some direction that someone's not quite up to pace as quickly as possible, that's great. But is there also room in this discussion to really finally look at the fact that it's being, that, that these assessments have been used improperly? Well, I think, and Cassandra raised this issue too, I think the increasing assessment literacy and knowledge of what the assessment is designed for, what it can do, and what it can't do is the other half of this. Right. So um, being sure that you have the right assessment for the purpose that you're doing, you know, that the use is matched to the type, is part of an assessment literate policy environment. And we have seen lots of cases where tests, the wrong, the wrong test is used for the wrong purpose, or the right test is used for the right purpose, but we don't understand how. So uh, in general, I think, yes, this want, we want to create a deeper conversation around assessment, not just it's bad or it's good, but how can it be used appropriately at all levels of the system. I, I just, I've always wanted to know this too. Is there any, um, is there any estimate of how much money our state spends on these assessments, like finance, like the overall financial <coughs> costs of these assessments? You know, because assessment happens at all levels of the system in a lot of different ways, I think it's hard to fully quantify um, the exact cost. So. But also when you think about the, you know, what is it, 16 billion we spend on assessment in the state, or not assessment, uh, uh, 16 billion we spend uh, on education in the state. <laughs> um, and investment into assessments of a small percentage of time and money is kind of a return on investment question. Yeah. But no, I don't have a good yeah, quantified the, number, especially when you think about the whole enterprise. Well, well, is, is it, and how much is it really? Right, pretty. but again, some of that, that includes formative assessment, which is about instructional practice and what teachers are doing. So then do you count it as a cost of assessment or a cost of instruction, so. Right. Yeah. Richard? 
Uh, I just want to emphasize that uh, instruction includes assessment, mm -hmm. that the, the pitting of the one against the other <coughs> is artificial, and I, I, I don't like it when we do public relations pieces like the, like the YouTube video, which um, accepts that pitting of the one against the other. Now, the issue with the state assessments is redundancy. And obviously, to eliminate, I mean, redundancy in testing, as in redundancy in instruction, is a waste of people's time. So to eliminate that is a good thing. But just to say that we've replaced assessment with redundant instruction is no <coughs> gain. And I think uh, that, that issue could be made clearer uh, for people. The other issue that uh, is kind of fudged here is um, has to do with the purposes or one's philosophy of education. Uh, there has been a strong tendency in American education to see it as helping the individual become what he or she is. Uh, and that's incomparable with other students as opposed to traditional uh, standardized testing where uh, all students have the same goals and we compare with how effective they were in reaching those goals and, and that implies winners and losers. And so there's a tension in assessment philosophies of what assessment is for. Um, I don't, just what I'm skimming through this, I don't see it acknowledged and that's part of the confusion behind, you know, well it's assessment to help the student be what he could be or is it to uh, hold him and the instructional, uh, the schools that he's attended, uh, accountable for reaching goals that the state has determined are desirable and, for instance, literacy, numeracy for all of our students. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure how you're going to solve that problem, but, but thanks for working on it. Thank you. All right, so much more conversation to come on assessment, but this is the assessment literacy piece, so stay tuned. Thank you. All right, before we move to the next item, I just did want to recognize that we have uh, State Representative Amanda Price, who is Chair of Education in the House, here. Uh, she cannot be here during public comment, but she did supply a letter that will be read during public comment. So we just want to recognize and thank you for being here. Thank you for your work. Uh, next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is presentation of the 2015-2016 Milken Award winner. Uh, we're happy to once again welcome Kevin Topi, a math teacher from Hazlitt High School. As you remember, he was recently at the board table representing the Network of Michigan Educators. Today he's going to share with us his recent experience as the 2015-16 Milken Award winner. And joining uh, him at the table is Abby. Good morning. I am delighted to be at the table this morning to host Kevin. Um, to talk about his experience and, and to be recognized for his outstanding achievement as Michigan's 2015-16 uh, Milken Educator Award winner. Um, we're going to show a brief video um, of the award reception that occurred last fall and then the table will be turned over to Kevin uh, to, to talk with you all. The Milken Educator Award goes to Kevin Toby. So Mr. Toby looks a little emotional right now, but I'm going to ask him some questions about his role as a teacher. Mr. Toby, you're known as being a pioneer in the area of technology, iPads, bring your own device, Moodles. Why is all of that such an important aspect for learning? Um, technology just provides students with a tremendous opportunity and it uh, opens a lot of doors that weren't available to students five or even 10 years ago. And so it's, it's just been a, a, a tremendous way to uh, help them with their, their math. So you mentioned math. You have devoted your career to math, to helping young people learn it and love it like you do. Why? It's really tough to explain why somebody loves math. Um, <laughs> but I, I just, I, 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 I love working with the students here in this building. And, and 
math is just a, a means to do that every day, and, and it's unbelievable all the great people that, that are around this building right now, the students and athletes and, and teachers and administrators, counselors, whole staff that I get to work with here. And, and so I, I love math. I, 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 I'm kind of a weird person like that. I got a few other math lovers out there this morning. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry. It's, I'm usually, it's, it's a, I'm an amazing, amazing thing that you're doing here this morning. I, I totally did not expect this, so. <laughs> What Mr. Toby was really looking like that morning was sick. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Toby had about a 100 degree fever and was kind of standing in the corner and not really uh, anticipating getting a major award. And so sneaking out there was, took a, took a few minutes to collect my thoughts and, and try and put together a couple of coherent sentences for everybody. So um, speak a little bit about the, the Milk and Educator Awards. Um, for those of you that don't know, they, uh, it's a national award. It's an organization out of California, and they typically give about 25 to 30 of these awards each year. Um, there are some years where Michigan does not have a recipient at all. There are other years where there are multiple recipients um, from, from each state. Um, very uh, big connection or network out there of, of past winners. Um, I actually had to pass up an opportunity to attend. They had a meeting in New Orleans recently that they were going to just fly everybody down there, all expenses paid, trip to meet with the 2016 winners. Unfortunately, it conflicted with the McCall Conference in Michigan, the first week of track, parent-teacher conferences, and about five other things that I had going on. Um, fortunately, though, they're going to have another opportunity in Washington, D.C. within the next couple of years, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to being able to, to attend that. But uh, you know, the, the first week after, after winning that award, um, it, it was a lot to take in. And, and there's a lot of great educators in the state of Michigan. And I'm somebody that's grown up around the Lansing area, been in Michigan my whole life, went to Michigan State University. And uh, the, the more I thought it through, I, I, I just, it's a great opportunity to represent a lot of um, influences on my life from my family to, to Michigan State, to the district that I work in, students I get to work with every day. And, using that award as a vehicle to get some of those, those ideas out there. Um, I had an opportunity to sport, speak in front of the uh, Ingham County Board of Commissioners. Uh, it was at the Mason Courthouse, <laughs> and my dad actually worked out in Mason for, for over 30 years as a teacher, administrator, assistant superintendent, took over as an interim superintendent for, for a little while. And just to be able to be out there with some of the people that I knew from Mason, um, one of the parents of, of some students that I had was on the board a, a former uh, co-worker of mine at Michigan State was director of the board of, of commissioners and so um, I, I think it, little, it means a little bit more when you've been around here and you've chosen to stay when a lot of my friends have left the state for other reasons and, and kind of feel like I can represent education in Michigan. Um, I'm also part of the Network of Michigan Educators now, which is a group that has Michigan Teacher of the Year winners and other award winners, and I uh, was able to attend the ESET 2 conference right away after winning the award, and um, it's just amazing to, the types of conversations that I've been able to have as, as part of this. Um, I also have to say that it's been a, kind of an interesting morning because I came from administering the SAT, PSAT at my building. <laughs> Come right in to talk about assessment this morning. And I also have a fifth grader taking the M-step this morning. And I, I think it would be take a little bit to coerce the smiles that I saw in the video out of, out of any of the uh, students that I saw today. But uh, it was a, definitely an interesting conversation. And I was, I was glad that I was able to see that and, and hear some of the very thoughtful questions that you asked. So I was, I was really impressed by that. Wanted to participate from back there. Wasn't sure if it was appropriate. So. <laughs> How about now? Uh, yeah. Anything you'd like to know about assessment from a teacher's perspective, I'd be happy to share. So, um, but yeah, if any, if any of you have any questions or anything about the Milken Awards or life in general of Mr. Toby. <laughs> Congratulations. It's, it's really great. I've met some of the other Milken Award winners and gone to one of those conferences. It's really terrific. So if you can get to one, uh, that's and oh. the advice that the other winners gave there was was tremendous. You know, they they took me aside right away. We had a nice about hour long conversation afterwards, and kind of telling me to pick my opportunities that were going to be available. Um, 
I also think it was it was kind of interesting in there. The first thing that the first question they brought up was was technology, and I do do a lot of innovation with technology, and, and that's great. But as some other teachers in the building reminded me, you know, I think what what my students enjoy being in my class and why they get a lot out of it is is more the relationships I try and build with students, and I think that's so much more important than any of the technology or anything that we do with it. Um, it's nice to be innovative and everything like that, but to be known for that is. Um, one last thing I want to add to you, if, if anyone was interested at, at the Milken Educator uh, site, I actually just did an interview and that is up in this past week and so that's one of their featured articles or it's, it's on Twitter there if you, if you are a Twitter follower. So. All right, Rick. I just want to say congratulations, thank Kevin, <laughs> on behalf of the Network of Michigan Educators and thank you for your advocacy and for your hard work and your dedication for teachers um, throughout Michigan. For the whole Milken network, um, now that you have this distinction, you know your voice matters, and you'll be called on to to offer words, and and people will listen to you. So um, I can't think of a better representative. So congratulations. I have a question. Yep. Uh, exactly. What is it that that you were awarded with? In, in terms of the actual award, right. it's twenty five thousand dollars that can be used in any way. There is no strings attached to it whatsoever. Um, which is very rare in any field, let alone education. Um, and then again, to be just become part of this overall milk and network, and, and talking about teachers back as far as 1987 that are still very actively involved. Um, like I said, within that first hour, we had a conversation about I was looking to do an online type of geometry class, and um, one of the people brought up, we know uh, there's a person in Utah that's doing this right now, and we could get you in contact. And, and just having that kind of connection is incredibly valuable as a teacher so and Kevin stand up good to see you you get an obelisk too uh, I have a question how, how, what is the volume of an obelisk how could we compute that <laughs> my class we, we're doing that right now so. on behalf of the board I just want to again congratulate you and um, say on behalf of all the educators who aren't getting this award I know you represent them as well and there's nothing more powerful as we all know <coughs> than a great teaching that inspires and engages kids particularly in things like math where we too often don't or kids assume hey I can't do it and I know my eldest daughter you know she had a great teacher like you in high school said come on Lydia you can do this and they did math aerobics and all sorts of things and now she's doing tax budget policy and is an economist so yeah, congratulations that's what you can accomplish and uh, enjoy this award and enjoy and as Rick said take advantage of your your celebrity to help inspire others and other great teachers so take care here's your obelisk Congratulations and thanks for what you do each and every day in building those relationships and making so a difference. Yep. Next item on the today's committee, the whole agenda, is presentation of National Board Certified. So we have another celebratory moment. We are happy to have with us Alicia Beard of Southfield Public Schools and Arteria Barnes of Detroit Public Schools, the most recent <laughs> National Board Certified Educators from Michigan. We also welcome Nancy Schwartz, the national representative of the National Board, and Denise Walker, who represents the National Board here in Michigan. And of course, Rick Joseph, the 2015-16 Michigan Teacher of the Year, a National Board Certified Educator, will lead us through this presentation. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I guess we're ready. Uh, my name is Nancy Schwartz and um, I work for the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. I was asked to talk a little bit about what's new at the National Board. There's a lot that's new and I'm going to run through some quick slides before we get to the main purpose uh, why we're here which is to recognize the new board certified teacher in Michigan. Um, just a really quick, a lot of you have followed National Board for many years. You know that we started in uh, 1987 here in Detroit and we certified our first board certified teacher in 1994. We were always thought of as an organization that could work with others to be a catalyst for change, primarily around how teaching is defined, making it more of a profession. We think of it now as three developments in a career of a teacher, building practice to accomplish level, getting boards certified, and then spreading the expertise among others in your building and among the novice and pre-service teachers in higher education. We've built the 
career continuum on that of a medical model. The National Board was originally thought of as part of a medical model. Um, and the reason why we did that is because we think the preparation for those who pursue medicine is tightly coupled. It is reinforced along the way with experts through a residency program that leads to a clear understanding of what's expected of you. You then become licensed, and then after you're licensed, you pursue board certification. When you have a nice, structured, linear path, you'll see that 80% of medical doctors are board certified, yet for teachers, we've been able to accomplish 112,000, but we've just skimmed the surface with only 3% of today's teachers board certified. <coughs> what I'd like to talk to you about today is really what's different at the National Board and how we're tapping the expertise of NBCTs to bring National Board to the school site. If you use this as the continuum to which we aspire, the purple or the blue section is where we begin. We want to really see the number of board certified teachers in the state of Michigan expand dramatically. We think we can do that the way our new assessment is organized. They then become instructional leaders in their building. They then work with their peers to become board certified, or they work as adjunct faculty to the university to help improve teacher preparation programs. New York is an example I just want to show you. They have embedded standards along the way from EdTPA in teacher prep to board certification for the professional license. <laughs> then NBCTs become instructional leaders who then give back to the profession. We would love to work with the state of Michigan in doing something like this here. Briefly, I put a lot of materials in your packet because I know we're short on time. What hasn't changed at National Board is our five core propositions have been the same for the past 30 years. It's the structure about what we think accomplished teachers should know and be able to do. We have high and rigorous standards, the highest in the profession for almost all teachers who teach in a pre-K through 12, and it covers 25 different certificate areas. We can hit 95 to 98% of all teachers in Michigan currently. What's different is that we now offer four components. It used to be a year-long process. Now they can do it over three years. It can become part of their professional development in a PLC at a school site. There was a lot of discussion a few minutes ago about literacy. Our fourth component, the one that rolls out in the fall, is on data literacy. It is the one that's gone through the most change. So there'll be one um, assessment that they take on content knowledge and then three portfolio entries that they can do over a three-year period. And we hope it's integrated into their daily work and it's offered to them at the school site. The second big change that we are now offering, and I'm just going to touch on this, we've taken all the cases and all the, what we call cases, it's the video entries and the written commentaries from board certified teachers. And we now offer them as thousands of examples of tagged um, to tagged frameworks. Uh, those are some of what's up there. So if you're in a teacher prep program and you want to know what it means to teach um, to deeper learning competencies, we have them tagged. Their actual classrooms, the written commentary that went along with the entry is there for the novice teacher or the pre-service teacher so they get a sense of what accomplished teaching looks like much earlier in their career. We think in doing that will help them move into schools, be more successful. This is also being used in a lot of school districts now as part of teacher induction programs. This did not show up, but what I wanted to end with, oh, there it is. <laughs> the third, it's a surprise. Uh, the third change and the one that I'm really excited about is that um, part of the network of Michigan educators now has a network of board certified teachers. And sitting to my right is the past president of the network. In your packet is a current letter from the president of the network. And this is a group of board certified teachers pretty strategically scattered around the state who are ready to work with you on the strategic plan here in Michigan. We're excited that you were included us and we're anxious to uh, work with you because we think that board certification becomes the kind of job embedded school-based professional development that teachers really want. And I've put a quote in here from Rick because I think it perfectly summarizes the new board certification. 
the best professional learning I've ever had. When teachers come together and they work on practice, it's the kind of experience every teacher should have. So um, some websites are there available for you along with my email. And now I'd like to turn it over to Denise Walker, former president of the Michigan NBCT Network, for a special introduction. Thank you. Um, I am a board certified teacher, 2010, in literacy, reading, language arts and, uh, for early and middle childhood. So it's my pleasure, and on behalf of the Michigan NBCT Network, represented today here by Rick Joseph, by Jan Party, who has been a tireless uh, candidate support provider for years. I'm honored to introduce the new NBCTs for 2015. These teachers have achieved the highest credential available to American educators, national certification, through the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. These teachers successfully completed the certification by submitting portfolios, which included student work samples, videos of their teaching, along with extensive analysis of their teaching and their students' learning. They also successfully completed assessment exercises, exercises demonstrating their deep content knowledge in their chosen content area. So, I am so proud to introduce to you Artira Barnes from Detroit Public Schools, who certified in literacy, reading language arts, early middle childhood, and she brought today a colleague of hers to support her and we want to congratulate you. This is your Thank National you. Board pin. We want you to wear it often and very proudly. <laughs> um, Alicia Bird, a teacher from Southfield Public Schools, also certified this year in literacy, reading language arts, early and middle childhood. Unfortunately, she was unable to be here today, but I commend her accomplishments. So, congratulations. We're very proud of you. So with the time remaining, um, we'll be happy to answer questions. We'd like to have our board president uh, present a certificate here. First, congratulations and um, on behalf of the board and on thanking you for your great work and service. And I would note that as part of our agenda to get uh, everyone in Michigan better educated, we're naming uh, the enhancing teacher quality and supporting more of the national board certification process as robustly as we can uh, because educators who have that opportunity and then are able to turn on our kids. So congratulations, Artera. As a, you are talking about the medical model, it's something that our team is talking about in terms of teacher prep. And then, of course, as you know, this is included in our top 10 and 10. So we do want to work with you. Uh, we do believe it will make a difference. It does make a difference in the lives of kids. So very exciting to, to work with you on it. Kathleen? I'm really excited that you are from the Detroit Public Schools, too, which <laughs> yeah. I am, too. That's, that's great. So yeah. congratulations. Thank you. Good luck, and hope you spread the word around. So can I just say one thing about Detroit? Um, it should be noted that Detroit probably has more board-certified teachers than any public school in the state. And the reason is because they made it a priority for years. They used it as their professional development. There was contact contract language that supported it and there was staff that worked with teachers who wanted to go through. So one of the most robust programs has always been in the Detroit Public Schools, which I always thought was really, really important. Right. Well, I'm glad to know that when you said that because I just, it's good for people to know that they're really good teachers in there Detroit. Are. Yes. Um, contrary to popular <laughs> perception probably. Right. So thank you. Thank Congratulations. You. Eileen? Uh, <clears throat> uh, having uh, just a moment to look back, uh, a nation at risk in 1983, um, the National Board in 1987, Jim Kelly uh, leading this with uh, Governor Hunt, and uh, we've I've watched for a long time, hoping that it would be stronger than it is in participation, knowing how strong it is in quality. So delighted that you're here today. Congratulations, and looking forward to the next steps for you and for teachers. I had to uh, jump over because our time is limited, but I do want to say that um, I think in the revisions that we've been through, the four components and a way of offering it as at the school site through PLC rather than teachers doing it separate from their day job um, 
is going to make a big difference. Um, teachers tell us regularly, just like Rick said in his comments, it's the best professional development they've ever had. The reason is because it's focused on their students in their classroom. It's about them improving their practice. But it's that ability to work with colleagues. So I really hope with um, when ESSA and the changes from the feds come forward that there's a way that we can sort of bring it up again in Michigan in a new and different way because I think teachers, I mean, you know, we tend to have a more established teacher in Michigan than many other parts of the country. That's a good thing, but that really means that you want to develop those teachers to be the best they can be because they tend to stay in teaching longer. So you want them to be as accomplished as they can as soon as they can. Rick um, and then I wanted, Richard. I just wanted to say, say thanks, Abby, to you for your support from your office and, and the acknowledgement that we really um, – are aware of the equity piece that's involved here. And there's a real need throughout our state to provide um, excellent educators, um, especially in high needs areas, because that's what will create st stability and sustainability. Um, and also, of course, to Nancy and, and Denise and, and Artera, congratulations. It's, it's such a wonderful accomplishment um, to you and, and to all the educators in DPS, because um, there is very much and has been an awareness, as Nancy said, that, that um, when you're in a district like DPS, you're, you're constantly doing everything you can to be the best you can be. And you're constantly searching to, to hone your craft and improve your practice. And this National Board um, certification does just that. Another thing that's key is that when I, I achieved certification in 2000, when I was still a teacher in Chicago Public Schools, and in Chicago I was part of a program where we actually worked with the teachers union. So there was very much a collaborative effort um, with the, the Chicago Teachers Union Professional Development Center. And I had a conversation with Governor Snyder at the Governor's uh, Economic and Education Summit about National Board Certification as a vehicle for helping move Michigan forward um, as a top 10 in 10 state. And he was receptive to the notion that um, this approach towards creating uh, board certification for teachers is extraordinarily powerful. And also the opportunity to involve our union partners in helping the unions reassert their role as professional learning providers, that also gives them an added impetus to be part of this um, as partners. Um, and and I, I do have to say that, you know, as Nancy has, has said repeatedly, in 21 years of teaching, I have, I have never had a better, more robust, more meaningful professional learning experience than this. It was, a, it was a calendar year, 12 months, where I met with a cohort of people once a month on, for six hours on Saturdays, once a week for three hours in an afternoon, we took a look at video of our classroom teaching. We analyzed research. We took a look at best practices and, and, and our student work and how those interface. And it has been transformative for me. And so I really wish that, that we can do whatever we can to move this work forward for um, the students and the teachers in the state of Michigan. So if I could just uh, tag onto one thing Rick said. Now imagine instead of going on a Saturday to um, a union center, where you work with colleagues. Now imagine it's there as part of your school day. Imagine if you want to go back to the topic of literacy, I would point to our component two, which is on differentiation in instruction. And it's all focused on student learning outcomes, how you know you're reaching your students. If you're not, what do you do? Now imagine that as part of a PLC that would be led by any one of the three, four NBCTs in this room. And you do that on an ongoing basis. And then that becomes the conversation that you have with your colleagues until the next time you come together. And imagine you do just two components one year and two the next. And then you have a cohort of teacher leaders in school sites that can become your instructional leaders. And then you're not only being more efficient, but you're being more effective and you're building the kind of capacity to better meet the needs of students. That's what I think we have now with the new national board. Richard? Um, I noticed uh, a couple of um, okay. claims in here that uh, students taught by board certified teachers learn more than students taught by other teachers. Uh, and the Los Angeles district um, uh, found that uh, students made learning gains equivalent to two months of instruction. I'm just curious, what's the basis for these kinds of they're all research. They're all research based. The Los Angeles study was done uh, by a team at Harvard who were they were looking at LA in particular and one of their findings. What what makes a difference? Master's degree, where they went to their undergrad program. What was it that made a difference? And one of the few things they found, we have quite a robust national board program in LA USD. Much like um, Rick just said, it, it's been a union. Um, management uh, team for over 15 years. So they found board certified teachers tended to have a greater impact. 
Th there but, is a research how, how piece. How did they measure the impact? Was this assessment scores? Um, yes, scores? it was. Okay. And um, there's a research piece I put in your packet. Very good. Um, it should be referenced there. And then you can go to our website. It's all there. It, we did not do that study. That was done okay. independent of us. The, the only reason I raise a question is it has sometimes been claimed that student assessment scores are invalid for measuring teacher effectiveness. But apparently these studies rely on that to show the effectiveness of this program. Yes, I think it's, um, we could get into that discussion, but I won't because it's not my area of expertise. Um, I guess it's the degree, to, the degree to which you can say with certainty when you use student test scores what the results were. But it was sufficient. Also in your packet is a Washington State study and a Chicago study that also showed both board certified teachers have a greater impact. Um, but the combination needs to be true. It's student data, but enough NBCTs in a school site that what you measure is the consistency of board certified teachers at a site. One or two, not going to make a difference. That's why we need to get to 80% like in medicine. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much for your Thank time, you. energy, and congratulations. Yep. We do have two other legislators here that I'd like to introduce who can't be here during public comment and who will also be submitting comment for that time. Representative Hooker, good to see you. Thank you for being here. And Representative Tice is also here. She, stepped she stepped out? All right. But uh, both of those representatives can't be here during public comment, but will be submitting comments for us to read at that time. Next item on the committee of whole agenda is discussion regarding criteria for grant programs. Does anyone have any questions for staff regarding the criteria? Only that it would be nice if it was more than $225,000. We would agree with you on that one. <laughs> All right, seeing no other questions. So good morning. The time is now uh, 10.50, and a quorum of the board is present. The Board of Education meeting of April 12, 2016 is called to order, and the first order of business is approval of the State Board of Education minutes. Is there approval of the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting on March 8th? So moved. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? I, I don't know if it's important enough to note. I was yep. just looking at the board comments and um, the last, there's a paragraph that, two paragraphs that mention my name and my comments and one was, it ends with, which is very concerning to her. I think that that's an uh, issue that's concerning to all of us and I think that the point was that uh, we make it a point to put topics um, on our agenda that address those issues. All right, we'll correct that. Okay. Eileen, please. Uh, I wanted to uh, point out that I, I am submitting um, proposed revisions and comments of mine on the LGBTQ guidelines as President Austin asked me to do. And also, um, uh, because I believe my presentation on Representatives Representative Santana's Day in Detroit was a bit garbled, uh, I wanted to point out that I was allowed to attend a representative, a state house uh, activity that uh, that he put on in Detroit, as opposed to uh, joining him. So, I right, we'll correct that. Corrections. Thanks. Yep. No other. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Approval of the minutes of the closed session of March eighth, twenty sixteen. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Moved. Support. And supported. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed the same. Motion carries. President's report. Nothing going on, really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, John. <laughs> um, appreciate the representatives being here and appreciate we're going to hear a lot of um, uh, perspective on the LGBTQ draft guidance soon. Uh, so I guess I wanted to just take my time to or put that in context um, a bit, we, we collectively have a set of priorities that we need to keep working on that are all about how we help uh, improve student learning, lift achievement, improve the life outcomes for all of our kids. Uh, whatever zip code they live in, whether it's Detroit or Flint or everywhere uh, in Michigan, whatever country of origin, whatever race, religion, and whatever sexual orientation or gender identity our young people are. I mean, that is why we are working together and we can't lose sight of there's many fronts in this offensive to lift achievement. We have, and working together, need to advance our top 10 and 10 agendas, which include things that aren't at all controversial. Expanding early childhood, very powerful. 
expanding early college and post-secondary credit taking for more of our young people so that they get that leg up, uh, expanding parental engagements. Uh, we need to continue to work together as a state to improve our charter and choice policy so that it works to improve learning and doesn't hurt finances and learning outcomes for students. We need to improve our school finance model as we're recommending and in our top ten we're encouraging and I hope an education commission that the governor's appoints can help us use all these studies and I was happy to uh, be appointed and with Brian to help work with others to support uh, school finance reform long overdue that helps kids in poverty learn and all our kids um, get the learning outcomes by spending our money smarter that we do spend. Um, we need to have a school turnaround effort that works, whether it's CEO model or non-CEO model, that lifts achievement and turns around schools. And we need third grade reading, and Representative Price, you've been a fantastic leader that helps kids learn at third grade. Uh, I mean, that's the whole point, and we need to work together to make sure that's what we're doing. We need a solution, hopefully coming soon, for Detroit Public Schools that help all those young people, whether they're in a charter or a traditional DPS school, get a great education. And support that education and I hope we will and we've advocated for uh, the direction of that kind of solution so urgent for Detroit. Um, but it's also this is why this guidance was developed uh, to begin with. Um, our staff have been working over the years with hundreds of school districts and tens of thousands of students uh, who are gay and who do face learning risks twice as more likely to not go to school because they're not feeling comfortable or bullied, twice as likely to get bad grades than straight kids. And supporting these kids uh, to better life and learning outcomes has been going on for some time. Uh, and they're also four and a half times more likely to be at risk of taking the attempt to take their own life, our gay <coughs> kids. Uh, and that things can be done. In many schools, dozens of schools are doing things that help uh, create an environment where these kids act the same and are engaged the same as learning, but also schools around the state. Uh, we're asking for best practices to support the growing number of transgender students, gender nonconforming. These are the most at risk of taking their own lives if the environment is not supportive of them and acknowledging them. Uh, and schools we're asking for, what is the best practice around naming, around bathroom use, and what are the legal obligations we have to protect these kids? And that's where this guidance was developed by a team of thoughtful educators from around the state, mental health professionals, to answer that call from local schools who want to help these kids live and learn. Uh, and I would note these are, again, voluntary, locally determined, flexibly applied is the goal here. So everyone can at least have in front of them best practices that do create an environment for all kids, gay, straight, and transgender, to thrive and get engaged in learning, as many schools around the state are already demonstrating already. Um, there are legitimate concerns that have been raised, certainly around parent involvement, uh, bathroom use, locker room policy. How can that work for the safety of all students, gay and straight? And we definitely want to listen to each other and improve upon the voluntary encouragements we give to schools so that they engage, as we said in the initial guidance, uh, engage on a case-by-case -case basis with school personnel, with parents, with the students to help uh, work out an environment in that school that works for that local school. It's not directed from Lansing, but it's something that works for all the kids and all the parents in those schools' communities to ensure, quote, the safety, comfort, and healthy development of all students, maximizing inclusion and integration, minimizing exclusion and stigmatization. And now a good, healthy public discussion of what's at stake here, how we understand and how we can encourage the best possible environments that support all kids is great, and that's what we're here for. We can clarify any misunderstandings, and we can clarify our guidance, and that's what we're committed to over the months ahead. So we're going to take our time. A good public discussion of, of this topic is, is valuable and important. Um, I had a great talk with the Representative Potvin, who couldn't stay earlier, to help him understand the context of from whence this came, uh, bubbling up from school communities around the state that were interested in doing better by all their kids. Uh, and we do want, and I hope ultimately, recommendations voluntary to local school communities that we do want to offer and encourage them can work for the vast majority of people that are truly caring about what we say we care about, the safety and security and the learning outcomes for all students, gay, straight, and transgender. Uh, there are some, perhaps, nothing where nothing will be acceptable 
to those if you don't believe being gay or transgender is a reality. Uh, I personally feel we are all best served if we appreciate and accept uh, kids and adults who are gay and transgender as who they are. And we create an environment that supports them, helps them thrive in school, which is our job, and helps them live, uh, live great lives. And I, as all of us have been talking a lot about this, I just remind us, I was up in the UP a few weeks ago and was with some of the Ojibwe Keweenaw Bay leaders. And I asked them the question because I had heard other cultures, other our tribal communities had long identified that there are transgender people among us. And I asked a woman from the Keweenaw Bay tribe, is this true that you've always embraced and understood that there are transgender people, what we're calling them these days? Because, oh yes, we call them two spirits. Uh, we believe they're stronger than other people. Uh, our head man is a two-spirit of the Kiwana Bay tribe. So like many things, um, we would do well to appreciate the wisdom of our native peoples who have long understood that there are all different sorts of people among us and that they all have a chance and deserve a chance to um, be celebrated and certainly in our case, educated. So we welcome this. I want to reiterate we're going to have an ongoing process of public discussion and reflection and improvement on these voluntary draft encouragements to school communities who do want to help all their kids thrive, and the gay kids, the straight kids, and the transgender kids. Thank you, John, for your report. And uh, I'll give the report of the superintendent. And I agree with John that you know this is an important topic, and that's why we extended public comment. We'll continue to take public comment, and we'll work with the board on some revisions, as John uh, mentioned in his comments. And we'll look forward to continuing to build uh, uh, recommendations that will help our students be safe and uh, our schools given uh, guidance. So look forward to more work on that over the next few months. Also I've had since the last board meeting had an opportunity to visit Novi schools, Allegan, Risa, Holland, Davison schools, Lapeer, Chatfield, Whitmer, Prescott, EAA, Birmingham, and Detroit and I was joined by Kathleen Strauss visiting the EAA schools and again I We'll keep the board informed of my school visits, and you're welcome to join in on any of them. Very exciting in these visits to see things that we talk about in our top 10 and 10, and that's deep learning, students taking ownership of their learning, goal setting by students, the options that students have through CTE programs, five-year college programs, um, teachers really working as facilitators, seeing classrooms where kids uh, are groups of three or four and really doing different learning and different learning styles, taking the same material, but learning it in multiple different ways. And it's just very exciting to see the good work being done by our teachers all over this state. And I, I know Rick's been doing a lot of visits and has been seeing it. It's just, you know, I think uh, I, we just need to really appreciate our teachers and administrators for the good work they're doing uh, and the changes that they're making in the classroom, uh, the different type of instruction, student-led, the deeper learning, the questioning, the problem solving, and really seeing teachers change from the leading the classroom to facilitating the classroom and, and helping students uh, really take ownership of that learning. And just a lot of exciting things going around in our schools around the state, and I thank the teachers and administrators for doing that had the opportunity to speak at a lot of different events. The one I want to highlight is the Association of Government Accountants because that was an award presentation to our own Dan Hanrahan who won the Excellence in Government Leadership Award. He almost didn't go to the luncheon and so that would have been really embarrassing for me to stand up there and give a speech. Kyle and I were there to give him the award only to find out he didn't go. So we were glad that he ended up going to the luncheon. So. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to a report of Michigan Teacher of the Year. Rick Joseph, please. All right. Thank you, Brian. You good? I think we have to All right. One of the opportunities that I have um, as Michigan Teacher of the Year is to speak before groups of people. And uh, what I've realized is that when I'm able to, to share personal anecdotes, that's what really gets people's attention. And when I'm able to sort of 
um, connect the dots for people between my own experience uh, as, a, as, a, as a human being, as a, as a man, as a dad, um, as an educator. Um, they see me as a real person. And then when they see me as a real person, then they, then they accept the fact that I might have something to offer, offer them that might be of use, that might be meaningful. So I was able to speak before about 400 uh, pre-service teachers uh, at, at Grand Valley um, while they were preparing to become educators themselves. And I talked about the incredible importance of forging relationships and the reality that education at the end of the day is a relationships game. The extent to which we can get to know the people that we serve in any capacity, uh, person to person, human being to human being. That ultimately has a significant impact on our ability to reach and teach them. And that was the message that I conveyed to those pre-service teachers at Grand Valley. I then went off to Vandercook Lake uh, in Jackson County and at the invitation of one of their teacher professional learning coordinators, I had some professional conversations with teachers about content-based literacy and the understanding that we don't only teach reading in reading classes. We don't only teach kids how to read in English class anymore. But if we want kids to be effective readers, we have to understand that as science educators, as math educators, as educators of the social sciences, we have to teach them how to read content material. We have to be direct and we have to be explicit. We have to be able to deconstruct materials, whether it's a textbook or whether it's a website or whatever it may be. And that was the nature of our conversation at Vandercook Lake High School. These teachers gave me about an hour of their time during a staff meeting. And what was the best part about this is I was able to get physical education teachers to sit down with science teachers. And I was able to get math teachers to sit down with people who traditionally only met with colleagues in the English department. And what they realized is that they had so much in common because the ways in which they taught and the processes that they used to instruct their students were so similar that the, all of a sudden the PE teacher realized that, that, that he had something to learn from the physics teacher and vice versa. And that was one of the most powerful components of this experience. I then went off to Clawson in suburban Detroit, and I went to Clawson Middle School and Clawson High School. And I was there for something called the Job Embedded Professional Learning Network. And as many of you have heard me say, I have three components to my platform as Michigan Teacher of the Year. Equity, literacy, and job embedded professional learning. And the whole point of job embedded professional learning is very much what like Nancy Schwartz and Denise Walker were talking to us about with national board certification. The whole idea is if I want to develop myself, if I want to learn as a professional, first of all, I have to have a philosophical understanding that I am a lifelong learner, that I am going to learn till the day I die, and that I'm always going to grow, I'm always going to improve. And the best way, or one of the best ways for me to do that is to have a conversation with my colleagues and to get together with the people in, the, in, in my own building, the person who, who teaches next to me. One of the craziest things that I've encountered is that in my, in my job, I, I taught next door to someone for 11 years and never knew what they did all day. I never knew what they taught. I never knew how they taught. And so the notion with job embedded professional learning is you get together in, in cohorts, you get together in networks with people, you take turns getting into each other's classroom, you watch each other teach. It would almost be as if everybody at this board table would have the opportunity to see how the Senate Education Committee conducted business, or the, the House of Representatives um, Education Committee conducted biz business, or the Appropriations <coughs> Committee, or maybe, Eileen, maybe you've had the experience where you've gone and, and I don't know, seen online or actually witnessed how other states conduct their education business, how other state boards of ed work. And this is very much the philosophy behind job embedded professional learning. How do we learn best from observing our colleagues directly and interacting with them? And of course, reading, reading research and, and being aware of the professional literature as well. So I was at Clawson High School, but one of the coolest things about being at Clawson High School is I got a chance to take a little tour and see how they do things each day. And I'm happy to say that at Clawson High School and Clawson Middle School, they very much um, are a community of inclusion. They're very much a, um, a community that embraces diversity as a strength. And they acknowledge the fact that uh, people come from all over, from all different cultural and linguistic backgrounds, and they all add to the greater 
development and strength of the community. I grew up in suburban Detroit, and I always knew Clawson as a white working class suburb. But I was amazed to find that they have a, a significant group of kids from El Salvador who have just recently arrived. And I, I heard Spanish as, as I was in the hallway walking by. I, I passed by and I heard this, this Spanish. And because I am a bilingual educator and Spanish is my second language, I couldn't resist the urge to go inside. And I met these amazing kids who, many of you know, the journeys of kids from, from Central America are absolutely harrowing. The, the, the over obstacles that, that, that children as young as, who travel by themselves sometimes, 14, 15, 16 years old, who come from places like Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, um, they, they have to get through their own country, then they have to get through all of Mexico just to get to the U.S. border, and then they have to get into our country. And what they overcome is absolutely unbelievable. And, and so I was really touched by the stories that I heard, which um, was confirmed in a book I read called Enrique's Journey by a, an L.A. Times journalist named Sonia Nazario, and she documents the challenges that kids face and the dangers that they, they under, under, undertake in order to reunite with family and in order to have a better life in the United States of America. Um, so these kids really touched me as an educator, but certainly as a human being as well. And this is a paraeducator um, who works with them at Clawson High School who does remarkable work and helps them negotiate sort of the terrain of their classes. Um, and because their second language is English, um, it's, it's, it's a considerable challenge for them to be successful. And so she helps them uh, deal with that uh, on a daily basis. I then went to the McCall Conference. And um, Mr. Toby, as you heard, mentioned uh, attending the McCall Conference. And some of you may have uh, been there in the past. It's an opportunity for teachers across the state of Michigan to get together and talk about all things tech. And something that um, Lupe, Ramos Montigny, she, she did some work uh, taking things apart and putting them back together at the, um, at the Kent Innovation High School in Kent County in Grand Rapids. And Lupe knows that, it, that, that maker space, the makerspace movement is, is very big and very popular. And what's so exciting about it is it engages kids. They, do, they have the opportunity to create things, to build things, to use everyday objects, to, to make sense of their reality, and to extend textbook learning into the real world. And so I was amazed because these uh, what's also great about the, the makerspace movement is it empowers girls. And as we know, there's, there's kind of a dearth of girls and women in the engineering uh, fields. And so what's great about makerspace is it, it empowers young girls to say, you too can be an engineer. You too can like the hard sciences. You too can embrace mathematics. And here's a, here's a, here's a practical way that complements the theoretical um, study. And, and, and I, I then, in turn, attended a session where I made my own Martian house. So just by using some simple materials, I was able to construct a dwelling that I might use if I were to live one day on Mars. And so while that may or may not happen in my lifetime or in our lifetimes, I do believe one day it, um, that will be a reality. And I was able to uh, uh, encounter that through this makerspace um, workshop at the McCall Conference. I then spoke to some cooperating teachers at Calvin College in Grand Rapids. These are teachers that host interns. They host student teachers in their classroom. And we did some work um, around students with ADD and ADHD and how best to um, educate children who, who have needs uh, with, with attention and, and have, have trouble paying attention uh, throughout the school day. And so we had some very, very robust professional conversations. Um, I had the opportunity to engage in something called Teacher Lab. Um, in my school district, Teacher Lab is one example of job embedded professional learning where teachers get together and take turns visiting each other's classrooms. They have conversations about what they've observed. They keep their focus very narrow on one instructional aspect of their work for everyone's professional gain. And so this is a math classroom um, where the teacher was uh, conducting a series of math games that were both traditional in nature and, and digital as well. And you can see the colleagues who are standing and observing the teacher interact with students, which was an extraordinarily powerful experience. And then in the afternoon, there were colleagues who watched a teacher who was teaching different reading strategies in a social studies classroom for fifth and sixth graders. And they, of course, again, were able to sit down afterward and debrief the experience, have conversations with, um, with this teacher. 
And Amy, are you here? Um, this is very much the work of Amy and Kimber and, and Lauren Childs, who's not here, but she usually comes. This is learning the Learning Forward Michigan people. Will you raise your hand? This is all about what Learning Forward people do. One of the big things they do, it's job embedded professional learning, and they support this kind of work where you learn from your colleagues, you get into the classrooms, and, and this is happening all over the state of Michigan. The, um, we have a network that's in southeast Michigan, but I was talking to a colleague in, in, in Kent County who, who is also using a number of different teacher lab techniques, and so my aim um, going forward is to help grow this network statewide and help em empower teachers to get together and go in and watch their colleagues so they don't have to wait 11 years to get into the classroom of the person next to you because there's some amazing expertise that's happening and, and we really need to avail ourselves of that. Um, Lieutenant Governor uh, Brian Kelly went to the bank and <laughs> I went to the bank with him um, because along with Michelle Fecto, we went to the Drew Transition Center, which is an amazing school for children with special needs. It is a Detroit public school, and they serve children, um, students rather, between the ages of 18 and 26. And as you know, um, Eileen Weiser and, and Michelle Fecto have worked very, very hard along with, with the Lieutenant Governor on empowering um, families of children with special needs, children who have learning differences. And so these young people have a variety of um, of experiences at their school within their school building. There's um, Michelle is going shopping. She got some things at the thrift shop at the Drew Transition Center. You can see from the image there. Um, but also they have an absolutely amazing urban gardening program, which is massive. And they grow tons and tons of produce um, for consumption in the Detroit Public Schools food service program. And then they also sell it at the Detroit Eastern Market. And they have the opportunities to um, provide healthy <coughs> produce for, for their community. This is a, a sewing class where the kids sang to us. They sang um, What a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong. Another sewing class where kids are working on some projects. These children are building planters. These kids are building planters that are wheelchair accessible, showing the Lieutenant Governor. Um, and then uh, Mike Craig was a finalist for the Michigan Teacher of the Year. You all met him last June. Um, he came here to our board meeting. He's doing some absolutely remarkable work, not only because he serves children with some very significant cognitive uh, differences, but also because he is working at the cutting edge nationally with urban gardening. And so these are some hydroponic um, seeds that have come to be grown as plants, and then he'll trans transfer them into these hot houses. So you can see they're probably the only public school in the city of Detroit that has a full-size tractor. Um, you might say, where are we? Are we in the UP? Are, are we in you know, central Michigan? No, that's in the city of Detroit. Um, right at this school. And so there's Mike showing the Lieutenant Governor and showing Michelle and a number of other people from Detroit Public Schools and other guests kind of how this whole program works. It was absolutely remarkable. Um, there's a number of amazing students there and they, as I said, have a number of, um, of life skills opportunities. There's Michelle doing some more shopping. Um, at a <laughs> And uh, they, they've, they view themselves as the one-stop support shop, me meaning they provide uh, social services as well as, as life skills and, and educational support for these students to enable them to be successful uh, when they transition out of this program in, at age 26. And so there was a significant number, fully, fully a quarter of the students at this school actually have jobs in the real world. They might work at Fairlane Mall in Dearborn. They might work at Subway Sandwich Shop. They might work in other places in the community in a structured work setting where they actually earn real money in real jobs. And so here they're kind of lining up and they're showing the Lieutenant Governor um, all the different places in the community where they work. And so uh, I, I continue to have very exciting and, and meaningful experiences throughout our state, uh, learning and growing as Michigan's Teacher of the Year. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. All right, next item is to go to state and federal legislative report. So Marty Eckley will provide us an update on state and federal legislative issue, and then Cassandra, uh, our chair of the board's legislative committee, will share an update on the March 1st State Board Ed Legislative Committee meeting. Thank you. The, uh, as, you, as you saw earlier today, the House is back in session and the Senate are back in session today after a uh, couple week recess. Um, there are several bills um, that are in the process that are our interest uh, to the board that the board has shown interest in. Is the, uh, one is the third grade reading bills. Those are in conference committee. And then there's moving legislation regarding Detroit Public Schools. Um, the Senate bills have passed. The Senate are in House appropriations, and the House 
bills on Detroit Public Schools are in House Appropriations too. So those are all in the process. They were discussed at the Legislative Committee uh, meeting last week, and I will hand it over to Cassandra Elbert. Thank you. Um, so yes, we did discuss the Detroit legislation. However, we decided because we have submitted two statements already that we probably don't need to submit yet another one. Um, so we, we didn't move forward on that. The other item that we did um, discuss at my request was the um, updating uh, Michigan, legis Michigan legislation um, com that complies with federal law. Since NCLB has now been replaced by ESSA, there's a number of things in, in state law that used to comply with NCLB and now are outdated at best. And so uh, the understanding is that the Department of Education is actually going to pull together a work group and go through uh, Michigan legislation to identify those items that could or should be updated to reflect uh, current federal legislation at the moment. However, there are, uh, there's one thing that I would like to stress the importance of moving forward on sooner than that, and that is the fact that um, we still have these four intervention models spelled out in state law, uh, which were a requirement for us to do if we wanted to be eligible for race to the top funding. Uh, as you recall, we passed legislation very quickly so that we would be eligible for this funding, which never came to fruition. But we are now stuck with this, um, with these four very prescribed intervention models uh, for the lowest performing schools. And so what we decided to do uh, with the help of the department was to draft a letter that could either come from the legislative committee, but I'm hoping more from the full board today, um, which lays out for the legislature what the upcoming um, strategy is. Uh, from the Department of Education, but also ask them in the meantime to please take a look at updating in legislation um, these four intervention models. So I will read uh, the proposed letter to you, and I apologize you're just now getting this. Um, I believe someone sent it to me yesterday. I completely missed it, so um, I'm just seeing it for the first time today as well. Or just copies. Yeah, they have. Everyone has copies, right? Okay. Um, so the letter would read, the State Board of Education supports updating Section 1280C of the Revised School Code to reflect the reauthorization of the Federal Elementary and Secondary Education Act, otherwise known as ESEA, or was known as NCLB, through the passage of the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA. As you may know, the ESSA has fewer prescriptive requirements than the No Child Left Behind Act, the previous version of the law. At the present time, the SBE, SBE encourages the immediate removal of outdated references to federal law in Section 1280C of the Revised School Code. The Race to the Top grant program in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 mandated school re redesign plans to require implementation of one of four school intervention models that are required for the lowest achieving schools. These models are the turnaround model, restart model, school closure, and transformation model. Michigan added these models to Section 1280C to be eligible to compete for the since-expired federal grants. These requirements are no longer reflected in the ESSA. The ESSA is designed to allow for increased local control and stakeholder involvement. With this in mind, the Michigan Department of Education is forming a work group for stakeholder input on updating state law and guidelines to further reflect the ESSA provisions. We invite you to join this work group and we'll keep you informed of meetings if you wish for us to do so. If you have questions or would like to participate in the work group, please contact Caroline Lether and I will not uh, mention the specifics there. Um, thank you for your consideration on this important matter. Uh, so so um, I had one more thing that I wanted to add and I just lost it. So I guess I will uh, ask for a motion so that we can Discuss. So I move the staggered adoption or approval of this. It's moved and seconded, so it is open for discussion. Eileen, please. So um, I understand the antipathy that the board has for the school reform office and John, the fact that it's outside hand. the department. And uh, certainly, as we move through uh, ESSA, uh, there may be other options that the department um, chooses that are more. Uh, in line with uh, uh, the new federal legislation and better for the state. The only question I have on this, since it's unlikely to be acted on by the legislature, is whether this is the cart going before the horse 
because I think that um, uh, it's unlikely that they will dissolve the, or that they will act on this before the way that the department is going to restructure is evident. Um, and I hate to, I, I, I understand the sentiments and I uh, support moving through ESSA thoughtfully and well, uh, but I, I don't want this to be viewed politically if we have a chance of doing something educationally um, in a few months that makes better sense for children. Okay, John, I saw your hand and then Kathleen. It's, it's a sort of different take on a, the similar issue. Um, I think if, if in fact, which I hope is true, our process of developing our response to uh, school you know, accountability systems and school turnaround that we get to newly describe under federal law, that it might be helpful to include some sentence around um, this to this effect, and maybe at the end of the last paragraph, paragraph you're talking about the Michigan Department of Education is forming a work group, at the end of that sentence say something to the effect of, and we'll be proposing new policies and practices to be most effective in supporting Michigan school turnaround if that is consistent with where Brian and Heath want to take us. Um, I mean, this, it is in our court to develop uh, a, a recipe for school accountability, taking advantage of the new flexibility and also new approach than what's in the law for school turnaround. So John, is that a motion to amend? I would, if well, if my colleagues uh, would be receptive, we could include that kind of Is that thing. accurate? Say that again, okay. Joe. Um, well, potentially, when we are referencing that the department is engaged with a work group for stakeholders, which I warrant would also touch the legislators, um, mm -hmm. to update our state law and guidelines to further reflect the ESASA provisions. And you could say, and as part of this process, we'll be proposing or developing new policies and practices to be most effective in supporting Michigan school turnaround efforts. Okay, so that's, that's a good idea. <laughs> so we got, it's been moved. I need a support so we can discuss. It's been moved and supported. Now we can discuss the amendment. Any discussion on the amendment? Are you Michelle? suggesting that we would take out the section on the four models? No, I'm, I'm not. No, that it's just the, acknowledging those are in law. No, we have a process okay. underway to okay. refresh okay. our accountability system and many things in education consistent with the new federal law, including school terminals. Okay. Any other questions on Eileen? So um, I would support that amendment, but I think it's in the wrong place. I think that the we've hired the superintendent to uh, uh, to enact the uh, uh, concerns that we bring as board members. I think that what you want to say is that mm -hmm. the uh, the department is rethinking all of these things based on ESSA and that one outcome would be the removal as that is as it is formed and developed one outcome would be the removal of these of this provision within state law uh, because I, I think to do it the other way around really presents a political picture as opposed to educational and we've been clawing to be educational so I would flip the two sections and then I would like to see what that sounds like well, flipping them sounds fine. I, I don't. I don't understand where. When you say flip it, where would you put it? Um, uh, well, I don't have John's wording, but I was uh, the first paragraph. As you may know, uh, the ESSA has fewer prescriptive requirements. It was designed to allow for increased local control and stakeholder involvement. With this in mind, the Michigan Department of Education is reworking uh, all aspects of uh, accountability and assessment. Um, it is forming a work group for stakeholder input, whatever John's statement So you're was. saying the, just move that paragraph, the paragraph to the second paragraph. Right. To before the second paragraph. Right. And okay. then the third paragraph would read something like it does right now, which I don't have a revision for. Uh, uh, I know, I think actually that, hang on, uh, let me just see whether that works okay. Yeah. So uh, we can take that as a friendly amendment if everybody are okay with just moving the location? Yeah, still would want to see it, just because I think it's confusing. Um, well, if we could come back to it in about five minutes, if Marilyn could wordcraft yeah. it, just to see what it looks like. We're after We're after lunch. Lunch. All right, we can bring it back after lunch. We'll bring it back after lunch. I, wanted, I just wanted to say that we discussed this, and, and I was the one that pushed to, to inform the legislature now mm -hmm. uh, that we're doing this. Let them know because they are, they they are complaining that they don't know what we're doing, and I think we should let them know what we're doing, 
why we're doing it and to invite them to participate if they wish to do so. Now maybe this could be reworded in a way to make that point the, more effective. I, I just was talking, I'm sorry, let me just, because I, I was mumbling. Um, uh, what I'm saying is move this up above there oh, okay. with John's wording in there. Uh -huh. Which I don't, I don't know how it would fit. I just, we just need to do it, yeah. and then at the present time would become the third paragraph. Okay. So we'll work, rework that and bring we'll it back after that's lunch. A good idea. Okay. Because then it but becomes I think educational. It is important to let them know that what we're doing before oh, we do it. Oh, absolutely agree. Yeah. Okay. Right. I yep. do remember what I was going to say before. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we decided to send this to the chairs and the ranking members of the House and Senate Education Committees and the House and Senate. K-12 appropriation committees. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so we'll, if you get, we'll work on the letter during our uh, lunch break. L do you have anything else for the legislative committee? Nope. Lupe, do you want to say anything about NASB delegate on legislative conference? Well, uh, I, I have to say that uh, Pamela and uh, Richard and Kathy and I attended uh, the uh, conference and it was very enlightening. It was uh, very much what I expected. We had very, very good speakers. We did apply to participate in an extended version of the SSA, but there was some confusion and so that part didn't gel, but um, it was very um, rewarding to meet the Secretary of Education from uh, President Obama's cabinet. Uh, he had very good uh, wisdom to share with us and he's looking forward to working with, of course, everybody in the country to make his position uh, even more productive. And at the same time, we as NSV delegates uh, working with him. So that's one of the great highlights of the event that I took. I would agree. Um, and we did get, we did spend, I don't know how many hours, about five hour, uh, about four hours um, around ESSA. And so we did bring back materials. Of course, things are quite fluid, as um, Brian and Vanessa have stated. So, um, but it was good to get that, that information firsthand. Um, okay. Anything else, Lopez? All right, then Kathleen Strauss, NASB Government Affairs Committee. Yeah, well, the, uh, they, we had a meeting of the committee there, and since I had been doing it all on the phone, it was kind of nice to meet the other people from the other states. But they're again emphasizing the work on the uh, Perkins Career Tech Education Act being reauthorized this year, and they sent a letter to the key chairs and ranking members to what they wanted, what they wanted, is really what we're doing in Michigan uh, to make sure that career tech is included in the general the curriculum, and that the people have an opportunity to take that and to get their their uh, math and English and credits and all that through career tech and have valuable it is. So that's that's one thing. Another is that the privacy, the student privacy, is a big issue, and that's being considered by the. Uh, in Congress as well. And I brought copies, this was not the legislative committee, but this was something we got, there were sessions on assessment, very timely, and one of the things they, they there was a, this policies update, which you'll probably get in the mail too, uh, says, take it off the consent agenda, nine questions state boards of education should ask about state assessment systems. But the way we want to read this before we, you know, in, in line of what we heard this morning. I thought the, uh, it, was, it was quite interesting. There was a lot of emphasis on the fact that ESSA moved the responsibility, of, a, lot of, a lot of responsibility from the feds to the states at the state's request. I mean, that was NASB and CCSSO, the Governor's Association. And, all. and uh, they pointed out what a big, responsibility that is and how we should be very careful, which we are being, and how we develop the new ways of, of implementing the, the, the law. So we're not, we don't have to wait for the feds all the time. We have to come up with our own plan and make it 
very, very valuable. And one of the things that uh, to that Secretary <laughs> King yes, we said, he, said, he struck <laughs> me as being a breath of fresh air, actually. He kept talking about, he wants to, he, well, maybe, I hope he meant what he said. Who was this campaign? He said, the John he King, the new secretary. The states. He wants us to give feedback. <coughs> he wants to know how it's working. He wants our suggestions. So I think we should take him up on it. And I'm mm -hmm. sure the department will. Uh, Give them our, you don't have to wait for them all the time. You should tell them what you want. And uh, that sounded like a good approach to me. So mm -hmm. I thought that was helpful. I think this might be a helpful uh, way for us to know what to ask the next time we have a presentation on assessment. So it was, it was worthwhile, I think. And we, there was one dinner that we had in concert with the chiefs. So we managed to have dinner with, with Brian. <laughs> All right, Eileen Weiser, gubernatorial appointee, Education Commission of the States, report. I have nothing to report. All right, then we are going to take, <laughs> uh, we can do the consent agenda. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> unless there's some controversy over there. All right, so I'll just quickly, consent agenda, does the board, uh, let's see, Items the board wish to remove from the consent agenda. I move support of the consent oh, agenda. So, uh, support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion? Well, I would like to have more time to look at the consent agenda before I say I am in support of. Okay, then we'll do it after. All right, we'll, we'll do it in the afternoon. We'll come back to it in the afternoon. We're going to break till twelve thirty for lunch. So, so he has.